Hey everyone, it's Swank Ivy, and I'm doing another Letters to an Asexual. This should be number 41. This is going to be a little bit of a different format, I guess. Uh, maybe a little more rambly and personal than usual. Um, I almost hesitate to make this video just because I worry that I'll be focusing too much on the negative as much as even the rest of this series kind of focuses on the negative, but, you know, I'm usually giving you guys tools to fight these kinds of assumptions, and to be honest, this is mostly going to be a bunch of stories about bad stuff, but, um, to maybe back up a little, my letter that I'm going to be addressing is not one specific letter that I'm going to be quoting. It's more the uh, repeated request that people often make of me to explain to them why uh, why do I need to talk about this if nothing bad happens to me if I don't mention that I'm asexual or whatever um, what exactly bad has ever happened to you that you feel like you need to fight for awareness about this or talk about it publicly um, I know I've talked about this more broadly when it comes to why I think asexuality awareness is important for everyone. But um, I, I feel like I just kind of want to finally make a video that's about my personal experiences, mostly the negative ones, where people have treated me differently because I came out as asexual or because I talked about being asexual. Um, the different things that people have done and said and um, some of them were dangerous, some of them were awful, some of them were just unpleasant and yes, some of them were uh, directly in response to some of the asexuality awareness that I've done but for the most part these are not um, so most of them will be somewhat relatable and things that could happen to other people in similar situations as well um, but I also want to put a positive spin on this before I start just to say that I want to share some of the painful things that I've been through as sort of a way to humanize my situation and connect with some of you who have also had experiences like these because I believe that even though it's painful it does help to develop solidarity and compassion so um, hopefully you won't just take these examples as a list of negative things that have happened to me but as examples of ways that the world tries to push at people like us and um, how you can still come out at the end still wanting to tell people who you are and still feeling like you have a place in the world and um, you know, it is true that sometimes we do connect through our pain, but um, I also want to say that you should not have to do this. I shouldn't have to do this, and I don't really have to do this. I'm choosing to, um, but you don't have to offer up receipts of where you've been hurt and in exactly what ways with details and dates before people should believe you that you've been through what you've been through. But... Um, yeah, I'm basically going to give you some of the specifics, uh, hopefully just mostly leaving out details that would be traceable to specific people, but I want to tell you about what it's been like to be an asexual person um, for me and where it's kind of backfired on me. And I'm going to go through ten little stories. Some of them may be a little disturbing to some of you, so please use caution when you listen to this video and um, a couple of these may be things that you've heard me say in other media but for the most part these will probably be new to you um, so uh, I'm going to start with uh, mostly um, things that happened toward my earlier life and I'm gonna go basically in sequential order um, to show you things that um, happened as they kind of progressed through 
my life and de various degrees of me being out as asexual or aware that I would be considering myself asexual. So let's start at the beginning. Story number one, I'll just call this guy Jay. Um, this was a guy that I, I only met in person once and it was actually, um, nothing really happened when I met him in person, but he was kind of a friend of a friend and I started talking to him on the phone and I was in seventh grade. Um, so, uh, this was an older guy that, um, I thought he was really smart and interesting and he thought I was smart and interesting and, you know, it was kind of, uh, fun, I guess, for a younger girl to feel like somebody older thinks that she's interesting. Um, and so I had some really good conversations with this guy on the phone, but he always had this sort of creepy vibe that I didn't quite know how to feel about. And I found out he was really into hypnotism. And he insisted that he would be able to hypnotize me over the phone. And because of some of the other conversations that we had had, he knew that I didn't uh, have any inclinations toward anyone, that I didn't want to have uh, relations with anyone, I wasn't romantically attracted to anyone, but you know, like, I was a very young teenager at this time, so it was understandable that um, this guy uh, suggested that maybe one day I would feel differently. But anyway, like, I didn't believe that he would be able to be successful hypnotizing me on the phone, but he really wanted to try. So I actually let him try. Um, and of course, it didn't even come close to working. But, um, you know, I'm a naive young kid. And, um, you know, I'm like, yeah, let's play around. And of course, I heard everything that he was trying to get me to do. And one of the things he uh, emphasized when he thought that I was, uh, I guess, in a suggestible state was that I would become obedient to him. And you know what that means. So um, sometime later in the conversation when I told him, yeah, I don't think that that worked, but I didn't have the courage to like confront him and be like, what kind of jerk are you that you're trying to make me obey you? Um, he kind of brought up sex-related stuff in the conversation and asked me if maybe I was starting to feel a little more interested in that sort of thing these days. And, you know, the whole thing was very creepy, but it was, um, uh, it was probably a mixture of just creepy guy and me disclosing that I didn't have those feelings, but it is very interesting that when a guy hears that you don't feel that, they're very focused on, I have to change that and I'm going to try to use really messed up ways to, to like forcibly change someone's mind to make her desire something that she says she doesn't desire. Um, you know, and I realize again that many people will say that's, you know, that's something that a guy would do uh, if he was, you know, a big creep. Um, he, that guys like him would try to convince unwilling women to have sex with him even if they weren't asexual, but I certainly don't think that it helped for me to bring that up and have him immediately uh, decide something needs to be done about this. So um, that's all the details that I have for that one, but moving on to the next one. In story number two, um, this is another guy named Jay. That's kind of strange. They both had initial J. Anyway, um, I'm in ninth grade, and uh, oddly enough, this is a guy I met through the same friend, so you're probably wondering why I didn't just dump that friend. But anyway, um, so I started talking to this guy on the phone. I was 15, I think, and he was 19. And um, again, it was interesting to have attention from someone who was a legal adult when you're, you know, a teenager. But, um, he was kind of like this, one of those philosophy bro types, which, you know, I hadn't had any experience to be able to recognize that kind of person. And he liked to have long, like ridiculous devil's advocate conversations. Um, and at that time I was actually dating a boy, um, 
I had a boy in my own grade who was my first boyfriend that I dated from the time that I was 14 to 15, my ninth grade year. And uh, this this guy on the phone, this J guy, he um, he periodically brought up my boyfriend and asked me how I was doing with my boyfriend and wanted to know if I was happy with him and started asking me like peculiar questions about what sort of um, physical things we had, you know, what kind of bases we had gone to, because that's not creepy or anything. And I mostly just told him it was none of his business, but, you know, I, I told him straightforwardly one day, you know, I don't actually want to do anything with him, and uh, so I don't, and he's good enough not to push it. And so this guy got really agitated about that, and he said, you know, I can't believe you have a boyfriend that doesn't treat you right. If I was your boyfriend, I would treat you right. I would make you happy. I would satisfy you kind of stuff. And I told him that's completely inappropriate. I'm not interested in those sorts of things. And he said, okay, so you're afraid to have sex. And I said, no, I'm not afraid to have sex. He's like, yes, you're afraid to have sex. You're afraid that you're going to get a disease or get pregnant. And I'm like, well, those are legitimate things to worry about, but those are not why I don't want to have sex. I just don't desire it. And he says, I'm going to prove to you by the end of this conversation that you are afraid to have sex. And, you know, if you have ever studied anything in psychology, you might recognize that this is potentially an attempt to encourage reactants, which is, a, you know, a... a response where a person is accused of something and then they feel like um, they have to um, stand up to the opposite, you know, that they have to hold their position and, um, you know, that they're going to um, they're going to prove that they're not afraid to have sex, in my case, by having sex, probably with him. Um, so he's trying to create a situation where I feel like I have to prove that it's not fear stopping me um, and that it'll somehow lead to me sleeping with him. So that, uh, I think that might have actually been the last time I talked to this guy because the whole thing was just so infuriating and again creepy that um, I, I just didn't want to have these conversations even though I found some of the other ones sort of, you know, intellectually stimulating and I didn't have a whole lot of that going on in my high school days. So, um, you know there's always good and bad with these things, but uh, with someone like that, it's uh, it's not worth the good. Um, so, uh, yeah, he d obviously did not prove to me by the end of the conversation that I was just afraid to have sex. So that is story number two. Moving on. Story number three is kind of a big one, um, and those of you who have seen a lot of my other materials have probably seen me talk about my second boyfriend before. Um, he was pretty much a dirt bag, a lot of our relationship, and, um, he was not my idea. I had learned from the first one that if I didn't feel attracted to someone, I probably shouldn't date them because it would just become really frustrating. So, um, this guy kind of worked on me for more than a year trying to get me to date him. And, uh, eventually when he proposed that he didn't really want anything to change in our relationship, he just wanted a special designation, like as if it would be in name only or somehow prove to him that he was important and special. And, like, I cared about this guy a lot, partly because he, he did have a lot of, uh, you know, crappy stuff going on in his life and he was just so sad and whatnot, so, um... Anybody listening to this probably recognizes that type where um, well-meaning, somewhat naive people sometimes feel like they want to and can save people like who are like that. And that was definitely what was going on with me where, you know, I, I didn't really have the heart to say to this guy that I thought that he could someday be loved but not by me, you know what I mean? So um, I did... Uh, I did agree to his terms where, oh, you're saying I don't have to change anything about we, the way we interact physically or anything like that. And he's like, no, 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 you just, you know, I want to call you my girlfriend and I want you to call me my your boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. So, of course, that didn't work out very well because within like a week or a week and a half, he was already trying to change the rules. He repeatedly said things like that he 
was he was being deprived of sex because he couldn't pursue it with other people while we were together and I just told him go ahead like I don't care this wasn't my idea and you know he, he just didn't seem to understand that bullying me into the corner and getting me to accept being his girlfriend would not just suddenly make me turn into a typical girlfriend who desired him that way or was jealous of his other relationships. So, um, anyway, I, I was really clear throughout the relationship that I didn't desire him that way and that the things he tried to do to make me interested that way were not working. But at that time, I mean, I'm still in a pretty naive phase of my life there. I was, I think, 17 or 16. Um, when we started dating, and um, I, um, I was kind of looking for a magic switch where I had tried enough things and humored him enough that I could definitively say, okay, this isn't for me, everybody shut up now about how I can't know until I try. I did not sleep with him, um, but he still seemed to think that eventually I would. And he used to say extremely gross things to me, like telling me how big his penis was and that like a small woman like me would have a really hard time taking it. So I was going to need to train my vagina for eventual entry of his penis, um, you know, giving me ideas of what I should be doing to train for this. And it was really sickening, like the whole thing was really gross. Um, but. Uh, you know, I did try kissing him, I tried some, you know, some minor things that I guess go into the category of foreplay. None of them were pleasant. Most of them were things that I actively disliked, and some of them were just like, okay, this isn't good or anything. It's just, I, I'm waiting for it to be over. So, um, you know, uh, all of that was kind of of dubious consent as well, because I did feel pressured into it. Um, but I did say that he could try it. It's just certainly wasn't my idea. And then he would try to manipulate me with whining about how if I didn't like it, then he must have done something terrible and he's a bad person. But, you know, then the next day he'd be offering to give me a massage and um, mysteriously start you know, touching places he wasn't supposed to touch during the massage, and and if I'd catch him at it or stop him or yell at him, he would, he would immediately just turn into this sobbing pity mess where, oh, I'm terrible, I'm such a horrible person, I don't deserve happiness, blah, 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 blah. You probably know the type, but anyway. Um, so... Eventually, I did end up breaking up with this guy um, in a weird, manipulative way, of course, where um, first he slept with my best friend because he um, he liked her, too, and she and I had talked about it ahead of time, and she's like, yeah, your boyfriend's hitting on me, and I'm like, you, you can sleep with him if you like him, you know, because that would maybe get him off my back. And she's like, all right, I guess I will. And she did. And, you know, he calls me crying and asking to be punished. And I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, but anyway, um, long story short, he, he tried to, like a week shy of us having been dating a year, he um, asked me if maybe I should, we should break up because I wasn't happy. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. I'm not happy, see ya. And he didn't mean it. And he called again later, trying to get me to go back with him and insulted me, of course, when I said no. And, you know, eventually we, uh, you know, we, we didn't speak for a really long time after that, but sort of eventually became sort of friends again. Um, and throughout college, I used to see him here and there, but he'd still say really messed up things to me, like, I'm still waiting for you to get that package of romance hormones in the mail, and if you do, I expect to be first because um, I've been waiting the longest, I've been in line the longest, and I, you know, of course, I'm baffled by that, and I'm like, I don't think I'll ever feel that way about anyone, but if I ever do, 
I think it'll be person specific. I don't think it'll be like suddenly a switch flips and I'll desire people. So I'll, I'll do everybody who, who paid their dues. That doesn't make sense. And he was kind of disturbed by that apparently. Like he was just kind of joking around, but I answered him seriously with this. And he said, well, do you think you'll ever get married? And I said, I don't think so, but I'm not making a policy against it. If I find someone that I want that kind of relationship with, I will marry that person. And um, he was sort of silent for a minute, and then he said, oh, well, I hope you understand that if you ever do get married, I have the right to kick the shit out of your husband. So those are the fun things I dealt with, with a boyfriend who wouldn't accept that I was asexual and, uh, you know, pulled all the possessive cards. But, um, you know, again, even though my being asexual did play into how this relationship was really messed up, it also could have happened to, you know, anybody who didn't desire this, this particular guy the way that he wanted them to. I mean, you don't have to be asexual to be treated like that. It's just that, in my experience, um, you know, it was part of the equation and the bad things that happened in our relationship would not have had the same flavor or gone the same way if, um, you know, if he hadn't been treating my asexuality like it was something to train me out of and um, treating it like it was his own personal failure that he could somehow do something about if it wasn't working. So that's the end of my abbreviated version of my story about him. On to the next one. Story number four is one you have definitely heard about if you've seen all of my videos and or read some of the interviews that I've done. Um, this is about a fella that I met when I was 19. I met him on the internet and um, we'll just call him K. He uh, seemed like a nice guy. We hung out at a Denny's um, and you know I guess it makes sense that most people if they're a straight guy and a girl who is presumed by others to be straight um, are hanging out together you know the guy may think that this is a romantic date or a sexual encounter or something, but I made it very clear early on, you know, that I didn't feel that way. And he seemed, like, intrigued without an edge of aggression, which is unusual with people like him. So um, he asked some questions about me calling myself non-sexual, which is the term that I had adopted at that point. Um, and he, you know, he, he asked the right questions and he did seem to be listening to me and didn't say the usual judgy things that people usually say when they don't believe me or they think that it's something to get over so um, I kind of felt more comfortable with him after that didn't cause an explosion or rejection and uh, after the Denny's uh, food we went back to my place to play video games and that's you know really all that happened but um, I, uh, you know, I went back to his car with him to go get it from the Denny's. It was a, within walking distance, and he drove me back to my apartment. And then he says, well, you know, the night isn't complete without a good night kiss. And at that point, you know, the alarm bells start ringing. I'm like, what are you talking about? Weren't you, I, I know you were listening to me when I said, you know, I'm non-sexual and I, I don't like doing things like that. That would be, uh, that would be a misrepresentation of how I feel about you. And uh, he said uh, that uh, since the, the night isn't complete without a good night kiss, uh, he, he would accept a kiss on the cheek. And I'm like, uh, all right, you know, you can kiss my cheek. And he immediately, like, leaned over in this car and started licking up the side of my face like a dog. And, um, you know, obviously that was not what I had in mind for a, a cheek kiss. You know, so I shoved him away, I got out of the car, and, you know, I don't know what I, what I yelled at him, but I remember what he yelled at me. It was, I'm one of the, one, I'm one of the ones who wants to help you. Um, and that was clearly a reaction to me being asexual. That was, um, I mean, that's not something that could have happened in that context to, you know, somebody who just wasn't interested. 
Um, you know, he he carefully took in all of that information and still decided that he he needed to cure me. Um, and uh, maybe you'll sense a theme here, but I was still pretty inexperienced, pretty naive, pretty idealistic at that time, so I didn't completely lock this person out of my life, and he continued to send me messages on the internet until eventually I did block him for sounding dangerous, um, but during that period of time when he was still communicating with me, um, you know, he, he told me that he had thought that we were going to have sex that night. He told me that I should come over and watch porn with him. Uh, he told me how frustrating it was that I was pretty and that he wanted me and, um, that he could tell I wanted him back, but refused to admit it because I was in denial. And he even said, like, I took psychology in high school. I, I know what denial is. And, um, you know, don't, um, don't insult my intelligence, he said, because I have a great deal of respect for you. Well, BS. Um, but, you know, after he started saying that he could tell I was attracted to him and that sexual attraction is not a choice, it's a vibe that you communicate to me unconsciously, um, I decided this is actually a dangerous person who is explicitly ignoring everything I said about how I feel and choosing to believe that I feel the opposite of what I said. So that was, you know, that was when I blocked him and I never saw him again. I never dealt with him again. So that's the end of that story. Next. In story number five, I am a recent college graduate and I worked at a bookstore and a co-worker, we'll call him N, developed an interest in me. Um, at first I thought he was kind of creepy because he, shortly after he started working there, he was asking for my number, but then I overheard him asking for uh, the back room guy's phone number too because he wanted to make friends and he kind of seemed like he was really... Um, I don't know, socially awkward and confused about how to make friends, so I, I was like, oh, maybe he's not so creepy. Uh, but it turns out he was really creepy. <laughs> so, um, anyway, he would invite me to do things, and I would sort of tentatively accept, and then he, like, wouldn't show up or wouldn't confirm or wouldn't call. And so he was really flaky, but, you know, I, I couldn't tell whether that was because he's just a flake or because he didn't like me or something, so... Um, I did one day go out to a meal with him, but I paid for my own food because I was worried that a guy like him would think that if he took me on a date, then he should get to sleep with me. But, um, you know, nothing happened from that. But, uh, during that meal, he found out I was a vegetarian. And, uh, sometime after that, he, uh, he, he asked me if I would come to his house and help him prepare these vegetarian meals he had gotten and that it's, it's no fun to eat those kinds of things with just one person. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to go to your house. Jeez. But anyway, um, so he continued to offer me some strange invitations, including an invitation to come work out with him at his gym. I thought that was odd, but I thought the only possible ulterior motive for that was that he had some kind of thing where he thought I would be sexy in workout clothes or wanted to watch me sweat or something. But, um, and by the way, I had already told him that I considered myself non-sexual and whatnot. So, um, I, uh, I thought that he understood I wasn't a potential lay for him, and I also thought that maybe that was behind why he canceled so often, that maybe he tried uh, to line up several potential social engagements and always went with the one who was more likely to sleep with him, which was never me. So, um, anyway, N was uh, one day hanging out at the... Um, the cash register with me on a Sunday, really slow, and he says to me, um, he says, um, something about, uh, a test that you take online to see whether you're straight or gay, and I was like, I wonder how that test would rate me, since I'm 
non-sexual, and he said, you know, do you mind if I ask you some stuff about that? And I said, well, okay. And he says, see, the thing is, I've heard you say that before, but I thought that people were only non-sexual if they're, like, ugly people. <laughs> and I said, what? And he's like, yeah, it just doesn't really make sense to me that if you could get sex that you would be non-sexual. It doesn't make sense. So, obviously, he had no grasp of what was actually going on. Um, and then he started asking me, well, do you get enough exercise? And I said, well, you do the math. I work in this retail establishment where I walk all the time and I ride my bike to work. I think I get an adequate amount of exercise. Why do you ask? And he says, well, because also sex drive sometimes drops in people who are not very active. So maybe your problem is that you're not active enough. That's why I invited you to my gym. <laughs> so here's this guy and he's thinking, oh wow, I'm going to get her out to the gym and she's going to start running on the treadmill and then she's going to start thinking I'm sexy. So that was a fun situation. Um, now it wasn't, it, it was more humorous and cringeworthy than it was dangerous or weird, but... Um, when you live your life around people like that who have such baffling misconceptions about your orientation and then uh, explicitly conspire to change it um, in ways that aren't possible, you know, it's... Uh, I won't say I felt unsafe around him because he was, he, he, he was really just had this sort of harmless vibe about him, but at the same time, I don't like sharing space with people who are plotting to have sex with me against my will, you know, who are going to try to jumpstart my sex drive so that I'll want them. Um, it's not so different from, you know, guys who are pursuing an uninterested person or an unav unavailable person uh, in other contexts, but I think it falls into the category. Next. Story number six is a really hard one for me to talk about because it was someone I was close to. Um, and it was really, really hurtful um, because I thought this person was my ally and I thought this person knew better than what they did. So um, I'm not going to name who it was, but it was really devastating when it happened. Um, so I was talking about asexuality, and by this point in my life, I think I was in my uh, mid-twenties at this point. Mid to late twenties. I can't remember the exact time in my life of the, this incident, but it was within the last ten years at least. So um, I was probably 27, 28. Um, and um, let's see. So I was talking to this person about some unrelated thing. Uh, where there was an asexual character on a television show and we got into sort of an argument about why do you care about seeing people like you on TV? Like, why does it matter so much? Why are you so obsessed with this? And I was really surprised to hear this coming out of this person because I thought it was pretty obvious that, you know, I had known this person for a very long time and it, it seemed weird for them not to realize that it's important to see people like yourself in the media. Um, so I start trying to explain it, but I keep getting cut off. I keep getting interrupted with these random accusations about um, how am I sure that everything I'm doing isn't just attention seeking or so, so, so I can have something important in my life. Um, and again, this was really shocking coming from this person because I have not heard anything like this before or since. Um, but because by this point I had been in so many conversations with people who had less invested in me, um, I thought that the best way to deal with it was just mostly to wait until they stopped talking and saying whatever ridiculous point they were trying to make, um, and then try to calmly and quietly counter it. And you guys probably know already that uh, with someone who has as much experience as I do, it's hard to rattle me, it's hard to get me so that I don't know what to say, or I don't know how to approach 
an abusive interaction or something like that, or that maybe at least at this point, having dealt with it so many times, I wouldn't be emotionally affected, you know, but because of my history with this person, it was a very emotional argument. And it came to a point where the person told me that, um, everything I'm doing with my asexuality awareness activism is actually linked to my inability to form emotional attachments that it's all fear-based I'm actually afraid of men but I like attention and that the clothes I wear that look nice on my body are actually just a manipulative tactic to get male attention that I then can't handle, so I pretend to be asexual. And they started talking about someone gay that we both knew and how that was a fear tactic too, that you know this guy would announce that he's gay um, to keep women away because he was afraid of them, and that was really weird too, because um, I didn't believe that about that person, but... Um, you know, like I said, the tone of the conversation was very combative and it was really out of nowhere. Um, and that um, I would try to wait for them to stop talking and um, they would stop talking only for, you know, they'd run out of steam with whatever ridiculous point it was and I'd start to try to address it and then I'd just get interrupted again with more really messed up things that they're saying about who I am that are so awful to find out that someone believes this about you. Um, and it ended when the person uh, yelled five or six times that I was nothing but a cock tease. Um, and it's hard for me to admit, but that just kind of, it startled me into silence and I cried myself to sleep that night because I was in a situation where I couldn't leave that person's house. Um, and in the morning we woke up and acted like it hadn't happened, but, um, I don't know. It was really very strange. And I still think about that sometimes that, um, that is how that person sees me that I just like guys to look at me, but can't follow through because I am afraid it's so far from true, <laughs> but you know, it still affects you sometimes when you find out somebody that you care about that you thought was on your side thinks that you're just like a manipulative attention mongering person you know just that's it, it's pretty awful so I should probably stop talking about that one now because I'll just go in circles about how bad it was next story seven thank goodness this is a short one um, I was at a gathering with, you know, some people I didn't know, some people I did know, pretty crowded situation, and there was a group that was mostly people I didn't know very well, um, but I got into a conversation with this guy, and we were talking somehow about, uh, oh, I'm asexual, you know, I happened to mention it, and the first, this guy, I don't even know what his name was, I don't think I even knew then, um, he, he laughed when I said that first of all, and uh, he asked a couple of sort of dismissive questions and then interrupted me to say, well, you and me are going to go take a shower and I'm going to make it so you're not asexual anymore. Um, and then he kind of moved toward me like he was going to like pin me against the, the kitchen cabinet that we were standing near. And I think that the thing that was more awful about that than that the guy did that was that the other people in the group laughed at that and thought it was really amusing that he was suggesting he would sexually assault me into being straight um and you know he didn't do anything he just you know that whole thing stopped being a conversation because i don't talk to people who talk like that and you know i went to spend time with people i trusted but um you know i felt creepy about that obviously and um it's uh yeah it's really startling sometimes when someone someone responds to you feeling comfortable enough to say who you are in this particular fashion by saying like oh we're gonna fix that and i'm gonna like do a sex act to you and um intimidate you by moving closer knowing that you know i'm bigger and stronger ah so uh 
that was disappointing and scary and indicative of the attitude of a scary number of people in our world. So moving on to the next one. Story number eight begins with a guy I'll call M. Uh, he's a sort of friend of a friend I met through a group. Um, wasn't super close with him, and he came off as, um, uh, I don't want to say creepy, but he was, like, sort of oddly full of himself to the, to the extent that, like, he would say extremely self-aggrandizing things that most people would be joking if they said them, but he was dead serious. Uh, but anyway, he was, there was something a little off about him, I don't really know what, um, but, um, he was someone who would often be at the things I would be at. Um, he was usually nice enough, but he was similar to some of the earlier guys, the two J's that I talked about at the beginning, um, in that he really liked devil's advocate conversations and the idea of arguments just for fun and for intellectual stimulation, even though his partner would often have something personally invested in it that he was not respecting. So this guy, M, um, I found out from some other people that he talked behind my back a lot about how asexuality was bullshit and that it made him mad that I identified that way and that I tried to spread awareness about it. And he told one of my close friends that, you know, he doesn't say anything about it to my face because he doesn't want that argument mysteriously. But he was all about telling my friends that my orientation was bullshit. And I guess he assumed that they were all going to agree with him, that we all know that she's bizarre this way and she thinks she's asexual, but we all know she isn't. And um, I'm going to guess he didn't find a lot of support there and that probably ticked him off too, but... You know, I obviously couldn't, um, in good conscience, stay friends with somebody who's trying to turn my friends against me and try to un, uh, undo some of the activism that I've managed to do through word of mouth, who's trying to undermine my ability to describe myself, um, you know, by, by telling my friends that I'm full of crap? What, what gives, dude? Um, I did eventually, um, stop talking to him when I found out he was, like, super racist, too, so there you have that. On to the next one. So, how do I even describe number nine? Um, we're getting more into the modern era here. I've been an asexuality awareness activist for a long time, and, um, you know, I've done videos. Um, so... I never found out who this guy was or why he had a problem with me, but it was, this was through the internet, but despite it being somebody I didn't know doing crappy things to me through the internet, it was one of the more, um, obviously aggressively awful things that happened. Um, and that was that this person just decided I was funny and, um, involved 4chan, um, to create a page about me, I think it was on Encyclopedia Dramatica, he was building a page um, where he was connecting my asexuality activism to my probable, my probable uh, pedophilia. He tried to say that I mess with little boys and that I had molested children. Um, and at the time that he tried to do this to me, um, there was very little I had done on the internet under my real name. Um, I had given an interview to, I think it was Salon in 2005, and that was really the only time I had given my full name in association with asexuality awareness activism, just at the time. And um, so, literally, if you tried to Google me, you would not get much except for that Salon article and now this guy's in progress page calling me a pedophile and among other things that, you know, if it had just been insults about him thinking that my singing was terrible and that I am ugly or something, you know, okay, you know, you can call me ugly on the internet all you want, I really don't care, but um, 
when you bring in somebody's full name, and he did publish that um, in association with an accusation like that, that is uh, libel. Um, and uh, it could have, you know, if I was looking for a job or anybody was looking me up for anything professional, I certainly could have gotten into some questionable situations there where people would want to know why is it that one of the only hits under my full name takes you not only to a page where they accuse me of being a pedophile, but um, that the sidebar ads were all like explicit pictures of people receiving anal sex and stuff like that. You know, really just vile stuff. And I will also elaborate that uh, it wasn't just like, haha, he called me a pedophile. It was that he connected my asexuality to probable pedophilia, saying like that since my sexual appetites are deviant and that I hide these from the public, I pretend that I'm asexual to cover for the fact that I screw little boys. And he said that explicitly a few different times, like a few different ways, like it was a big joke to call someone a pedophile. Um, and I have to wonder what it is about asexuality that makes someone want to ruin my life. Um, because there are a lot of people who will ask this question, what bad could possibly have happened to you for saying you're asexual? Um, you know, they're saying that because they can't imagine anybody would have that much of a problem with it. But apparently this guy did, and apparently plenty of the other people who would have been laughing at this page, you know, are the types of people who would gladly um, make, a, you know, a completely fabricated situation just to mess with someone because they think it's funny that someone is claiming to be a marginalized orientation that they like to call fake, like all the different genders and whatnot, like that they like to pretend those are all fake. Um, so we're always targets in these uh, small, small uh, sexual and gender minority communities. So um, one of the reasons I say this was one of the worst ones was that um, I had to get a lawyer and I didn't want to handle it myself because, you know, that website and its whole network is they're they're so associated with large scale trolling that you know if I had contacted them myself without any lawyers behind it I probably would have you know been targeted for a widespread deliberate trolling attempt and those are never fun um, so I actually had to get a lawyer, I had to pay the lawyer, I ended up paying almost $2,000 for this lawyer um, to basically write a letter and give them a cease and desist letter on the grounds of this was libel and this was also copyright infringement because he was copying a lot of my website to make fun of it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, um, I was lucky that we did not have to go through with trying to sue this person because it is pretty difficult actually to get somebody on a libel suit and um, copyright is such a murky thing like how much of a work can you copy um, to say it's fair use or parody so that's really hard to prove especially considering you know different states uh, have different laws about those sorts of things but anyway um, I don't need to go into a lot of detail I, I just have to say that it was fortunate that they responded to the cease and desist letter by just removing the page as they were asked. I did not chase reparations. I wasn't going after trying to get money out of them. But, you know, that only happens, I guess, if you actually do go to court. But, you know, I had to pay for that out of my pocket, and that was not cheap. Um, and, you know, I, I ended up forced to do that or else just let this page with my full name and she's a pedophile written on it be out there so you know that was story number nine and I will now move on to number ten so the last story was actually pretty similar um, I had another online stalker this one decided to target me for 14 days straight 
by going onto one of the 4chan image sites. I don't really know that much about them, so I'm probably using the wrong terminology, but they went on to their image board and pretended to be me um, posting with a profile picture that was my face and linking to one of my letters to an asexual videos uh, claiming, you know, uh, that they wanted 4chan to ask an asexual anything and then they proceeded to um, deliberately answer everything anyone said with extreme condescension and like really awful commentary elitism all kinds of awful stuff um, it was kind of funny because you know, I could always tell when the trolling had started because my comments would immediately begin to fill up with filth. Um, most of it was somewhat harmless. I could just delete it and block the people, but... And occasionally I got actual questions from people which I was happy to answer, but, you know, this was literally... I would get thousands of comments because of this person. Um, and also he believed that I should be grateful to him for getting my view numbers up. I'm not grateful for hater views, sorry. Um, anyway, um, so for 14 days, every day for two weeks, this person went and deliberately impersonated me. Um, and in so doing, um, I did receive some comments from people who were watching that who thought that he was impersonating me, like they, they noticed that he didn't write like me, that he made a lot of spelling errors, um, and that he seemed to have a slightly different message, but most of them believed it was me. Most of them believed it was me trolling for views, for trolling for attention, um, or just, you know, that I, uh, I believed I was spreading a good message to the people of 4chan, for goodness sake. Um, anyway, but, um, most of what I heard about it was, you know, through other people, because I don't post there, I don't really know anything about it. But uh, one thing I also, I do know that this person did was, besides impersonating me, um, he claimed that being naked was no big deal to me because I don't think of bodies as sexual, so I pose nude all the time. And he had a couple of different photos of random models that, like, he didn't even try to put my face on them or anything. They just, like, they were, they were white women who had blonde hair that vaguely, maybe, with some imagination, might have looked like me. But he was pretending that they were me posing nude and claiming these, these were me naked. Um, and that I didn't mind doing that because I'm, I'm such a free spirit who doesn't think of bodies as sexual like all you dirty people. Um, so that was fun. Um... And, um, also he would, you know, he would, he would say weird transphobic things at the end of each of these sessions where he would, he would, like, admit what he was doing and then laugh and make a transphobic comment and then disappear. It was really odd. Um, but, uh, I guess he got upset that I was not giving him attention or that I was not having any kind of public meltdown about it or something. You know, I was just, I was addressing comments that needed to be, that, not needed to be, but, you know, could be addressed. And I was responding mostly to the unacceptable comments by deleting them and blocking them. And that's apparently really offensive to someone who's doing it just to get a rise out of you. Um, so he tried messaging me privately to say, so, I've been having a lot of fun with your message lately. I don't even have to change it at all to, you know, to spread the good word about asexuality. Um, it was really f just so messed up, and um, I didn't answer that. I just blocked him, and uh, he got upset about that, too. And when uh, people on 4chan called him out on not being me, and one person even went after him, like, why are you so obsessed with her? Why are you coming back here every day to pretend to be her? What are you trying to do? And he kept ranting about how I'm not acknowledging him, and that I'm not, um, grateful, or that I, 
my my website and my videos are terrible and they're shitty and that he's teaching me a lesson somehow by misrepresenting me to the good people of the internet. Um, I should also note that right around the exact same time, um, Craigslist ads were being posted in my name in Canada um, that had the exact same style that this guy was using, so I assumed this was him too, where he was posting um, weird elitist stuff. I don't even really remember what it was, but he was pretending to be me using my name, posting on Craigslist saying that um, he wanted to find other asexual people to hang out with because all sexual people are rapists and I don't want to be around dirty, immoral people or something like that. I don't know. So he was making these advertisements, basically, to try to get hateful people, I guess, to contact me. It didn't work. I didn't even get one message. But anyway, um, yeah, that's... Uh, I'm not sure what eventually caused this person to get tired of it. I'm assuming I'm not the only person he's ever done it to, but um, this wasn't just trolling, because I know that people just troll sometimes. They pick their victims very uh, deliberately, and uh, they look for somebody who is marginalized, somebody who is, uh, to them, other, somebody who makes them feel like um, I guess that feel like they're being challenged or that they're being uh, criticized because that's how a lot of people take asexuality. They assume that we are, our preferences are a commentary on theirs. Um, and maybe that was where he was coming from, where he wanted to take me down a peg uh, by pretending to represent my message, but distorting it so that I would get hate mail and taking satisfaction from the fact that I would have to deal with a bunch of abuse over my sexual orientation. Um, that eventually stopped on its own, but it was, like I said, thousands and thousands of comments on top of the conversation that happened about me where he was misrepresenting himself and uh, posting pictures that he claimed were nudes of me. So um, evidence of that does not exist anymore because that image board disappears the threads after they, they're too old, after they're only a few hours old. So I guess that's nice, and of course I didn't have to get a lawyer for that, but... So that's my final long rambling story about crappy things that have happened to me because of being asexual. So I'll add to wrap up that, again, I've said a few times that I know some of the things that have happened to me in a, that I consider to be in association with being asexual are not necessarily dependent on me being asexual for the story to go in a similar way. But we all have to understand that our identities are not separable like that. I will never be able to separate being asexual from being a woman. I will never be able to separate it from being of Jewish ancestry. I will never be able to separate it from, uh, you know, the fact that you know, I come from the backgrounds that I come from, so um, I'm never going to be able to say all of these things that have happened to me or that I have done in my life are, this is owing to me being a woman, this is me owing to me being of uh, a different sexual orientation than most of the population. Like, you don't, you don't get to tease apart the different parts of your identity and and say that bad experiences you have are only because of this one. So even though I recognize that um, there are a lot of anti-feminist and sexist attitudes that fueled some of the things that happened to me, they were also intersectional with my being asexual, especially when they explicitly called out me being asexual to criticize me, um, or to victimize me, or to try to make me more vulnerable so that they could take advantage of me. Um, and that that aspect of my character made them want to do that to me. Um, and I think that it comes from a place of they either want to fix me or they want to punish me for not being attracted to them, and either one is okay with them. Um, 
that is part of my experience of being an asexual woman in this culture. Um, so please, if you're thinking that you just, you want to respond to what I'm saying and say that only happened to you because, um, that guy was sexist. I really don't want to hear that kind of thing because I don't think that it's true and I don't think that it's fair to separate my being an asexual woman from me just being a woman. It will always be relevant and I'm tired of asexuality always being assumed to be the least relevant part of my identity because it is not. Um, so I would like to end this on a positive note and say again um, you don't have to tell me what you've been through to deserve my support. You don't have to have been hurt a certain number of times or a certain depth of pain to be deserving of inclusion in this community, of having resources, of needing connection. Um, you shouldn't have to feel guilty that you might not have it as bad as somebody else. I've kind of felt like that sometimes, that you know, if these are the worst things that ever happened to me, how can I say that I've ever been othered or more marginalized? But, you know, those are things that we're taught to assume we're not, we're not, uh, we're not worthy of this kind of care and attention. Um, and I think that we need to stop saying to ourselves that we have to have been hurt worse to deserve more comfort and more support. So, anybody listening to this who has felt like their sexual orientation, even if it's not being asexual, has, you know, caused them to be in situations where that they were taken advantage of or they were ashamed for it, like, I, you know, I've had my own experiences that were negative, but, um, they don't have to be the same as yours for me to say, I, I hear you. Even if you don't speak, I know that those things have affected who you are, who you feel like you deserve to talk about it uh, to, and just whether you even feel like you deserve to be part of communities that in part exist because they felt like they needed to hold a hand after being marginalized or experiencing violence or experiencing some kind of prejudice. Um, so I don't want anyone to think that I'm saying my prejudice or my marginalization experiences are equivalent to or similar even in some cases to theirs, but I want you to hear me. I want you to understand that these have, these have negatively affected who I am. They haven't stopped me from wanting to be truthful about who I am and continue to put my message out there to help people so that they feel that they have been heard and that they have learned some ways to deal with um, coming out on the other side of these terrible conversations um, and these terrible actions by others that can make them feel like they deserved to be hurt or make them feel like they'll never not be able to live their lives not being hurt. So, um, I guess I've rambled an awful lot in a very personal manner that, uh, is kind of atypical for these videos. Um, but I encourage any of you who feel like you want to share your story to open up to each other, open up to me, share it if it makes you feel good to share it, and don't let it feel like you have to carry those burdens by yourself or that they're not heavy enough for you to deserve help carrying them, please. So that's gonna wrap this one and I will see you guys in a happier video.